Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dimitri, that is Powell. Um, it's been an extra long day today, so we'll both be doing about half of the talk. We'll switch halfway, hopefully somewhat seamlessly. Um, this talk is about 10 years of free open source in Copernicus Emergency Management. Uh, roughly, it's going to be three sections, an introduction to the services in the Copernicus Emer Emergency Management, uh, and afterwards we'll talk about some of the problems that we've had, and we'll finish off with the solutions that we have arrived at. So this slide may be familiar to some of you, as if you have been here for the last tea talks, this is the third time you see it. Uh, but it's in the WF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. We've, we were established in 1975 as an intergovernmental organization. We have 23 member states and 12 cooperating states. We have over 400 staff in three locations, Reading, Bologna, and Bonn. We are a 24 7 operational service. We do operational numerical weather prediction, and we also support national weather services and businesses. We are also a research institution, as we do experiments to continuously improve our models, and we do our forecasts and climate reanalysis. We operate two of the EU Copernicus services, the Climate Change Service, the C3S, the Atmospheric the Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS, and we support the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, SEMS, which is what uh, we'll be talking more about today. Uh, so, more specifically about what SEMS floods is, SEMS offers critical geospatial information at European and global level through continuous observations and forecasts for droughts, forest fires, and floods. Specifically, we'll be talking about SEMS floods, which is a set of services provided by different consortia led by the EU Joint Research Center, GRC. As you can see, in the Joint Research Center, we are the computational center right there on the left side for you. And in the consortia, the actual partners for the service are SMHI, SHMU, DWD, just to name a few. Uh, the first service that is part of SEMS floods is EFAS, the European Flood Awareness System. Uh, it is publicly visible on www.efas.eu. Uh, on it, we show hydrological forecasts and also monitoring. Uh, on the right side, you can see there is time selector, so you can browse through different forecasts going in the past, uh, which is going to be one of the problems, as we have a lot of data to show. Uh, the EFAS is focused specifically on the European domain, and we also have GLOFAS, which is similar to EFAS, but it expands globally, so not just, not just focused on Europe. Uh, on these two services, we show quite a few maps, but that is not the only thing we do. Uh, Different layers have different features, which can provide information for the forecasters. That could be discharge hydrographs, return period hydrographs, average temperature, any information that would be useful for the forecasters. Uh, apart from that, not only maps and plots, on EFAS we build a whole other system for notifications. This allows forecasters to submit a notification for relevant authorities when a flood is predicted, so the authorities get notified and they can act accordingly to prevent and minimize the damage that the flood may do. Uh, behind the scenes, we have a hydrological model, which takes a few different inputs. It takes some static data, it takes some meteorological forecasts and observations. Running the model is the product generation step, this takes into account hydrological observations and some reference data, and the products that are then produced from it get shown on the web interface, which is on the left side here, the EFAS and GLOFAS model output. Uh, they come broadly in two different groups, is how we see them. We have shape files, GeoJSON, XML raster files. All of those get handled by a map server instance, and we have NetCDF, which is separately handled by an EC charts engine. 
both of those map server and EC charts are kind of hidden away behind map proxy, which is our tile caching service. And we'll go into more detail about that afterwards. Uh, in front of it, all of that is again hidden behind a Django container that hosts a WMS proxy, which broadly enforces authentication and some access control. And you'll hear about that some more details in a bit. Uh, and a REST API for the front end. So the front end is everything the users interact with. Currently, it's a content management system on Drupal, and we have a map viewer, which is where people get to see all of the maps, all of the layers, all of the data that we show. Uh, we have an authentication layer, which is used with the identity provider, Keycloak, just to make sure that we know who it is and have a standardized identity throughout the whole service. So all of this is containerized. Everything is running on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and it's self-managed. So the problem, we are switching off to Paolo to talk about some of the problems and how we have solved them. Hello. So the problem, what's the problem? The problem is uh, basically the fact that we work with data uh, that has a time dimension. Uh, I know f maybe for some of you this is uh, pretty much uh, standard, but uh, also there are many people working in, uh, in this domain that have never really worked with, data, uh, with time, and they don't really realize that this is a relatively complicated issue, especially if you uh, have a, a huge amount of data and you cannot really delete all data you need uh, to keep everything in place. So what we have here is that a WMS uh, uh, service uh, supports, uh, uh, you, you probably know WMS T supports uh, uh, the time dimension through the time parameter. Uh, but the problem is that this is not uh, really standardized that much. Or, or it is, but there are different implementations and sometimes very small differences may create many problems. For example, the way uh, you express at the time, time, time zone, uh, granularity is a problem. Uh, the fact that the time dimension may not be in the request, so it, it is perfect, perfectly ac acceptable WMS uh, request not to include time, but if you do have a time dimension, what, what happens if you don't have the, the time requested in the, expressed in the request? Do you provide a default uh, uh, value or not? This kind of, of problems. Also, uh, an interesting problem with the, in the, in the, um, in the uh, using the, the HTTP standards is the fact that there are many different uh, ways of caching the data that uh, you, you, the, the server is sending back to the browser. For example, there is, the browser itself is caching, you may have a load balancer, you, have, you may have a tile cache, you may have uh, different proxies in the middle. So if you uh, uh, cache a value that then expires after a while because you have this time dimension, then uh, the browser may receive an old, old version of the data and it's not aware of that because there is this uh, lack, for example, of, of time expressed uh, in, in the request. So we have to, um, to deal with those, all, all the, these uh, problems. Uh, also, in terms of uh, technology, we use Map Server. Uh, Map Server, if you if you have ever used that, you probably know that you have this uh, .map file where you configure the layers, uh, and uh, you can express, uh, for example, th the source of the data as a, as a, um, a Postgres or a shape file, and so on. But then, if you if you change every let's say 12 hours, this is our uh, most common case is that we, we every 12 hours we, we have new data. Then you need to change the source or to point to a different shape file and so on. So you need to uh, deal with those these small problems. It's maybe it doesn't sound that complicated. It is not. But then we will see how this combined with other aspects of uh, of uh, the service may may become more and more complicated. Uh, here, this, it's an example of, uh, uh, for example, you can see this, uh, uh, an, an extract of uh, get capabilities, and uh, you can see in the, in the bottom part of, the, of this box, you have the time expressed, this, I don't know if it's readable, maybe, yes, not uh, that much. The time is expressed as a dimension, uh, name equal time, equals time, then you have uh, a default value, and then you have uh, a range. Okay, that can be expressed in two different, uh, the beginning and the end, or it can be exp expressed in uh, uh, discrete values. For example, today, the date of today, yesterday, and so on. So these are also two different ways of accepting that, that you may have problems with that. For example, if you have a tool that doesn't support a continuous time frame or, uh, or vice versa. Uh, 
Um, also, we have different granularity. For example, we have some layers where we have data every 15 minutes, other where we, where we have data every hour, 12 hours, and also we have some seasonal and seasonal uh, layers where we have data only every month, for example. Then, of course, we have static layers like uh, uh, country boundaries uh, and uh, river networks and so on. So, where this becomes complicated. At the bottom of this slide, you can see this that is a, it looks like a, a URL. It's, it's actually a path uh, on, the, on the file system, for example. This is uh, the way that my proxy, that we, we, I will explain later on, writes uh, the tiles of, uh, to cache, to, to then, uh, send back to the browser without having to recalculate the image. What happens is that this tile, when you introduce a time dimension, uh, this time uh, it's, it's uh, saved in a directory that takes the, the name of the time parameter that you are using in the request. So this means that if this time parameter is, is not standardized, then you will create different tiles for exactly the same data. See, this is an, an aspect that we have to, to take into account. Another problem is simply the sheer amount of data we have to deal with. Uh, IFAS and GLOFAS are created as uh, services where we don't throw away anything. We need to keep data forever, at least for now. <laughs> so we start 10 years ago in, uh, in an operational mode, uh, and we produce now, uh, especially for, uh, for IFAS, we produce uh, about uh, three gigabytes of data daily. So you can understand that this amount of data becomes uh, pretty hard to uh, to keep. Also, we need to keep this in three different versions, production, uh, stage, and development. Uh, we need to, tra to try new, uh, new versions of the model. That's why we have development and stage version. Basically, uh, we, we tweak the model to see if some changes are improving the, the output, and then we need to keep this separate from production, but it also needs to be visible to our stakeholders so that the stakeholders can try the new model and for a few months normally, and then see if it's, if it's okay or not. So that's, this is a completely, so you, you multiply this three gigabyte, uh, three, three times, and then you keep this forever, that you understand it's, it starts to be complicated. And also one day, not, not too far from now, uh, we have to physically move all this uh, data from Reading to Bologna, because we are now uh, moving everything to the, our new data center in Bologna, so we will have a few vans full of tapes that will <laughs> move from, from the UK to Italy. This is an example of how we, we handle this uh, huge amount of data in these three different environments. What happens is that before a release, uh, let's say we have this new version of the, of the suite, we, we send this data into the new version to development and staging so that this is the, basically staging is open to the stakeholders. It's the validation uh, environment, while development is the valid, uh, development environment. So this is more for the developers and this is for the stakeholders. And this is the production one, so this is the, the, the one that stays as it is. Uh, after the release, however, we need to keep the old version uh, available in case there, there are problems with the new version. So it's, it's a contractual agreement that for like three months, we need to have the old version online. So we keep it in the staging environment. So we switch uh, the time of the release, we send the new version uh, to development production only and the old one in staging. Uh, then we have another problem that we may have new introduced new layers, but the old layers need to stay. So for example, going back to the example of the configuration file in map server, we cannot keep one single version of the configuration file because when you have a new layer, but you also have the, the old one, the old one will be only visible when you browse in time back uh, before the date where you introduced the new layer, for example. So in the screenshot where, uh, that we, we saw before with uh, that, uh, Dimitar, uh, the, the screenshot of the, the map, uh, Dimitar pointed out this small widget with the, the calendar, then you can browse in time back to 10 years ago, for example. 10 years ago, we didn't have all these layers that we have today, but we had old layers that we don't have anymore. So we need also to handle this. The fact that uh, data change, the structure of the data can change, uh, and this needs to be somehow reintroduced dynamically into the map file, depending on the date that the user choose in the interface. Also, we, can, we, we may have changes in time resolution. 10 years ago, we didn't have two cycles per day. Uh, we are going probably now to have more. 
uh, cycles per day. Uh, some layers have, uh, as I said, uh, one uh, output every 15 minutes. So all this, then we, for example, the very simple example, we change from the calendar where we only have the date to the calendar with the date and the time. Now we have 12 and 00. zero. We will have more, probably. Then we start, you start to introduce uh, time, you start to the problem of the time zone, and so on. And finally, the, uh, the additional problem is authentication. Why? Because we have some layers that are uh, open, open to anybody. And uh, imagine this uh, dimension is the user privileges. If you are, uh, if you're not authenticated, you can you only uh, see some layers. But also, we have some layers that are free to everybody only after 30 days, for example. So you cannot see the most uh, up-to-date uh, uh, forecast, but if you go back 30 days ago, you can see it. So in, in reality, it's a bit like having a three-dimensional space with layers, user privileges, and time. So if you map this on a three-dimensional space, you can see like almost like a, uh, uh, a block where this is uh, the, the requests uh, f falling in this block are should be uh, should not be fulfilled. So you get uh, 403, 403 like uh, access denied, and then all the others are are okay. So you, we need to basically take into account all these things. How do we solve this problem? Um, basically, the idea is to have uh, a proxy. That um, with uh, which, which is a Django application that uh, controls the, the requests coming in and uh, checks the authentication of the user that is uh, linked to a profile which is linked to a, to, a, to a partner. So if you are part of a certain uh, 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 organization, you can see the the, um, the the layers. So the request is fulfilled, and also taking into account the time dimension, the same thing. So basically, we have uh, like a filter, which we call it WMS proxy, which is a simple uh, uh, Django application that filters all the requests. So how this is implemented is implemented, as I said, the Django application uh, that sends the request to map server. Map server has this uh, map script, uh, this extension that uh, exposes the APIs to uh, to uh, other uh, programming languages. In our case, we use Python. Uh, and with Python, we manipulate the configuration of map, map uh, server. So what I said before about, for example, finding pointing to the right shapefile depending on the date is done in Python within the, the map server environment. Also, other things that you can do using a map script is to change part of the request or part of the response before sending back to the client. For example, for uh, the get capabilities, this is a very, very important example. Get capabilities in the end is like uh, if you want uh, an index, uh, a list of all the things that the user can get. Because uh, what the user can get is influenced by the, the authentication level, uh, access control, it's not the same to, to everybody. So basically, this XML file cannot be cached and sent back to any browser in the same way because it depends on the authentication. So what we do, we get uh, a clean, uh, full get capabilities back to from app server, and then we remove the layers that are not accessible to that particular user, and we change the date. Uh, you remember the XML uh, uh, example that I, I, I showed before? We change that value to restrain, so that, for example, I said that we, you don't get it the last 30 days if you are not authenticated. So we change the date so that the browser knows, or the browser of the client knows that uh, the time dimension is limited. Then on top of that, we, we added uh, WMS, uh, sorry, this is WMS, yeah. this is the proxy that we, 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 uh, we wrote in, uh, in Python. This is what th does the, all this post-processing of the get capabilities, removing the layers not available for a current user, and changing the time, uh, the time availability for uh, that uh, particular case and uh, applying access control also to get map and get feature info. This is a bit more uh, clear because it's on off. Either you get, can get it or not get it. Uh, what is uh, more complicated is the get capabilities uh, because of this uh, need of uh, uh, reprocessing the, the response. And also what we do, because we have this intermediate step, we take the opportunity to sanitize the time parameter. Because uh, as I said before, 
if you don't, if you have uh, the time exhaust in different ways, this may create different tiles uh, that are exactly the same data but expressed in, uh, in different ways. So what we do, we take the time parameter and we transform it in a standardized format so that when this request get to map proxy, it's always the same for that particular date. This is a diagram to show all this processing. Basically, uh, this is, uh, imagine that this is a client sends a request to, uh, to this, uh, that goes through this map proxy, this WMS proxy. Uh, the get map and get capabilities are first controlled by this uh, access control uh, block here, this module. And then the XML, as I said, is reprocessed. We also use this intermediate step to merge two different uh, get capabilities. Uh, basically, we have map server, which is the, the normal one that you probably already know. Uh, this EC chart is our own software that is based on, uh, on uh, reading files that are a bit more complicated, like net, net CDF and so on. So w this already existed when we start IFAS. So basically, we decide to use a map server and EC chart as two different instances, keep using EC chart and merge the two requests into one uh, XML. So this is, uh, this is our... Uh, uh, basically, this is, this is the, the filter that uh, ensures that all the requests are uh, controlled by access control. And then we added recently also map proxy uh, to improve the performances when you use tiles. Basically, we, knew, we, we tried to use tiles before we had some problems. Uh, so we decided to introduce a caching layer, map proxy. Uh, Map proxy doesn't really work. We waited uh, a bit before doing this step because map proxy doesn't really work very well with dimensions. Only lately it, uh, it supports uh, the time dimension, but still there are some problems. For example, seeding and cleanup with the time parameter doesn't really work uh, because it is based on, uh, as I said, because the time parameter can be expressed in different ways, it doesn't really know what uh, directory need to be deleted and, and how to create new directories. Uh, also, the configuration is not trivial because it's based on a uh, static uh, YAML configuration while, as I said, we have all this way of dynamically changing the map proxy configuration while, when you receive the request. But still, uh, it is very good for uh, performance. Uh, we, we, we noticed that uh, uh, an improvement uh, really remarkable. So we, we still use it with some kind of adjustment. We don't, we don't use seeding. So the seeding happens basically simply because uh, uh, dynamically, so the user requests a tile, the first time is created, it's a bit slower, and then all the other times are, uh, the, the tile is already there, so it's fast. And the cleanup happens also with a custom script. And as I said, we, we try to sanitize the time parameters so, so we don't duplicate uh, the data. And that's the same diagram, but with my proxy in the middle. So basically, my proxy sits here, between the WMS proxy and, uh, and then our two WMS servers uh, with a disk cache. So the tiles is uh, created here, uh, created and stored here, and reused if, uh, if needed. And then after a new cycle comes in, for example, after another 12 hours, then you get new data, and the cache again is recreated if the request is for, uh, for the last uh, cycle. This is a bit, maybe a bit too technical. It's the authentication system. Uh, the only thing I want to, to highlight with this slide is that we keep all the information about the users in Active Directory. We try to stick to the idea of a single source of, of truth so that we can use this data also, uh, the, uh, data for example about the user, which user belongs to a certain organization also for the REST API. And this is used for the notification. Uh, Dimitar showed, the, uh, showed the, the, the slide with um, notifications sent to the different organization. It's, a, it's an important aspect because, of course, uh, if there is a, the risk of a certain flood in a certain area, you want to inform the, the organizations that are uh, affected by that area. So that with this, uh, in this way, we get when uh, the notification concerns a certain basin, with this API, we can get exactly the, the, the users that are, belong to that organization, all the emails. We compose automatically the email, and we send the email to the right uh, people. So the conclusions is that we had to use this WMS proxy in, in Python uh, to 
handle the time parameter and avoid some pitfalls. Uh, map server, th thanks to this map script uh, um, extension, let's say this, this, the way of, of using the API is very flexible. Uh, we had to play a little bit with the keyword element in get capabilities to express the, the fact that some layers don't exist anymore in the interface, but they are still, they, they exist in the past. Uh, the overall, overall architecture is a bit complicated because we have this custom place, custom bits plus map procs and so on, but uh, it was flexible enough to be uh, improved uh, along these 10 years. But still, we have a lot of code with a lot of if, this, and then that, because of this uh, change in the structure of the data along, in, in, uh, along those 10 years, which is, I think, inevitable, but that's life. And uh, future developments, I think we don't have much time for that, so we skip it because it's not super relevant. But I would like to thank you also other communities, because our work wouldn't be possible without uh, Map Server, Map Proxy, Django, Docker, Kubernetes, and so on. And that's all. Thank you.